It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here with the latest security news. Uh, we'll talk about Microsoft's second Tuesday updates, which happened yesterday. And then we answer your questions. Ten questions, ten answers. Coming up on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 373, recorded October 10th, 2012. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 152. Security Now is brought to you by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, visit audiblepodcasts.com slash security now. And don't forget to get your free copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion, absolutely free, at audible.com slash Sanderson. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects you and your loved ones online with Mr. G, Steve Gibson, our explainer-in-chief. He's the uh, the host at grc.com, the inventor of, uh, well, the coiner of the phrase, uh, phrase uh, spyware, the inventor of the first anti-spyware. He's also the author of Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. A very good day to you, Mr. Gibson. Hey, Leo. It's great to be with you again, as always. A Q&A episode today. You know, and before we began recording, I mentioned to you something that Elaine had mentioned to me that, well, it's belated and then some, but we sort of let an anniversary of the podcast slip by un noticed, unmentioned, unobserved. But this must be our third or fourth year by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Let me do the math. Modulo yes, 52. Right. <laughs> you and I can do that because you only missed one show per force. It wasn't your idea. We oh, made you miss believe show. me, I've never been forgiven for that, Leo. That was Who does not forgive you for that? Who? Our listeners. Oh, they oh, were quite on. upset. It's, well, it's that uh, we had, we were... We'd never missed a week. And, I, you know, I, I like that kind of absolutism. I, I know just, you do because you're an engineer. And it's yeah, like, it's well, exactly. perfection is the only option. It's either true <laughs> or it's false. And it had been for a long time. Suddenly, it's never false. again. So it missing be. one episode is as good as missing 500, really, from your point of view. Anyway, at one point we were talking about our anniversary, which <laughs> um, slipped by in August. Oh. We... Uh, we ended our seventh year and began year eight, which is we're already well into. So three episode yeah. what three hundred fifty sixty four would have been the uh, the uh, seventh. Uh, ep- there's year. a lot of controversy about that, Leo. Did we Apparently, begin with one or actually, zero? You can't, you can't do any kind of a fifty two thing. You got to just look at the date, oh. and that's what that's that's what oh. Elaine did. She said your first podcast was on August something or other. Wow. And well, that, that another one of those went by. It's like, oh, well, I guess that would be the end of the seventh. Happy year anniversary, Mr. Gibson. Leo, we're going strong. Are we? That, wait a minute. We finished seven years. We're be, we're in our eighth year. Yes. Gemini. Yes. Gemini Christmas. Wow. And you know, we just haven't run out of anything to talk about. You know. It's, yeah. Uh, you were really. Uh, we've said this before, but you were very worried when we began this that there would not be enough, and we only did a half hour show when we first started. <laughs> It's now we're now doing four times more it's, each it's, week. It's freaky. I look back at the early podcasts and I think, whoa, twenty nine minutes, really? Okay, wow. So we it's almost four times longer, and <laughs> and we still haven't run out of stuff. So there was there was no. considerable misjudgment on the amount of horror that lay out there on the internet, waiting for us to reveal it. Yes, the horrors just keep on <laughs> coming. Speaking of which, well, yes. go ahead. Anyway, we've got no, go we ahead. have lots. We have. Interesting news. Um, uh, we've this is a Q and A episode, our one hundred and fifty second Q and A, uh, episode three seventy three. So um, I, I think we've got a good podcast for everybody, as always. Three hundred seventy three questions and answers coming. 
Uh, you know, I have uh, an ad. You know, before I, you know, we'll save the ad for after spinner. I just wanted to show you something because we usually do coffee talk at the beginning of the uh, show, right? What? <laughs> oh, oh, of course we do. Yeah. Yes, Leo. Yes. No, we talk we about coffee. We love coffee. So, um, and we have a sponsor, BespokePost.com. They, they, the idea of Bespoke Post. In fact, I'll go over the website so you can see it. Is uh, this is you know, I mentioned this I think the last time. You don't want to buy a geek. Uh, gadgets because they know what they want they got what they want you don't it's a dumb idea so if you're giving a gift to a geek why not give him something that he would not normally buy and that's what bespoke post is they're curated boxes of awesome <laughs> and if you go to bespokepost.com you can find out uh, more about what they what they do they have a variety of different boxes and i just got my bespoke post so they're 45 dollars a box although i'm gonna tell you how you could save nine bucks on that in just a moment um and you can you can choose not to get a box at any given time it's kind of like the box of the month club uh, but i think a great great gift for the geek in your life and this is what the box looks like so i just got my bespoke post for the month my hashtag box of awesome. <laughs> so let's let's open it up. I think this one, I hope it is, is the coffee one. So let me just, and that's why we saved it for this show. You, you know, there's this. There's funny what's sold out. The socks were sold out. <laughs> people wanted people wanted the box of swagger. So let me open this up here, and we will show you this month's what. Oh, no, no. I want to open it. That's the whole fun of it. No, this is the coffee one. That's the coffee one, too? This is the... No, no. I want to open it. That's the whole point. Is it, This is the joy of opening Bespoke Post. Lisa says she already opened it for me. No! No! I want to open it. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like getting a gift bag, right? That's That's part of the fun of it. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. Here it says, this month we're upping your morning ritual. Highlights here, instructional videos, and more online. Say hello to Luis, his brother Olman, and their labor of love grown and harvested in their family-owned farm near Nicaragua and Honduras. These beans stand out for their complexity. So there's a whole thing on what you... So we're going to get some coffee from the Santa Isabel Coffee Plantation, Café Integral. We're going to get a burr grinder, and then you know what else we're getting, the AeroPress coffee maker, which is the coffee maker I've, I've been recommending for some time. I'm a big fan of the AeroPress. So let me open that up. So all of this is $45. They guarantee that everything that is in the box is worth at least $65. So you're getting a deal. The AeroPress is 30 some bucks by itself. So you get the AeroPress kit. Which includes the uh, the paper filters that you use in the AeroPress. There you go, and you get the uh, you get the AeroPress itself. You know about that. You, do you have you used an AeroPress, Steve? Yeah, I have. It's the only and kind of coffee I, I I have made here at the office. I love it. Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, I do very much. I think it's the best way to brew coffee. If you're going to do brew, it's not for espresso. It's for it's kind of like a combination of a French press and a, yeah, and I, a chemist. I I tend to make it over strong. I think so. I need to scale oh, back. Oh well, I think and, it does a very good job of extracting the coffee. You do, from yes, the use, yeah, and don't boil the water. That's another tip. Are you boiling do, your water? Do, do or don't. Do not. Do not. Oh, you're never supposed oh, to use boiling water with coffee. Yeah, it never gets to a boil. 100, 175 is what they recommend. I usually do it a little warmer. So here's our here's our Cafe Integral. Look at that. That's beautiful. It comes in a little ball jar, so it's sealed. God, oh, this is great. And this is the this is I think that's kind of cool. A hand burr grinder. So anyway, that's our bespoke kit. It's one of many. I'll put this together and we'll we'll you know what? We should grind some coffee later. I won't do it now. <laughs> But I'll make some. We'll make some coffee out of this. That's your bespoke kit. So there it is, bespoke.com. Now you can save by going to spoke.com/slash/twit, and you could take twenty percent off your first gift box, which is great. You, they have subscriptions if you'd like. So the first box is forty-five dollars minus nine dollars for the savings. Free shipping, easy returns. The retail value of the box always far above the monthly subscription cost. And at the beginning of every month, they let you know what your limited edition selection is so you can opt out if you wish. It's a great gift for any man in your life, but especially geeks. Don't give them geek stuff. Give them stuff with a little swagger. 
Uh, you can give them one month, three months, or a half a year for 270 bucks. Bespokepost.com slash twit. And you might say, say swag with swagger. Swagger. Oh, I bet that's why they call it swagger. <laughs> now, now I get it. This is so cool. So, I mean, imagine, uh, I think this is the kind of thing that the geek in your life, don't send them an iPod. They're going to go, oh, I didn't want that. Or an iPhone, you know, set, well, maybe an iPhone 5 if you really want to <laughs> spend all that money. But this is a great gift. And co- who doesn't love coffee? And a unique way to make coffee that is going to brew, in my opinion, the best, if you're really serious about coffee, the best cup of coffee you've ever had. Bespoke post. All right, sorry, that was that was kind of long. I, I didn't mean to. Probably I should have listened to Lisa and have it opened already. But I kind of like, I like opening gifts. I don't know about you, but I wanted to open my box, my bespoke post. So, and you know what I did, by the way? Wednesday, last week, we had John Hodgman on. And I had the oh, shaving cool. kit. And I gave him the bespoke shaving kit. And he really liked it. it was an, this is another thing. If you want to, like a house gift, it's a great little thing to bring in a box. Is Here's your house gift. Just a thought. All right, let's get the uh, let's get the security news here. Okay, so we are here on what is this? The tenth of October, yes, sir. Uh, meaning that we had our second Tuesday just yesterday. Microsoft did a relatively small update. Um, there were seven updates, which fixed a number of security issues in Windows, Office, and SQL Server. Uh, interestingly. The big problems were not in IE and Windows, as is usually the case, but some sort of an exploit that affected Office and their server products. That was the only thing that was rated critical, which was a remote code execution problem, somehow involving RTF, rich text format files. So, you know, as always, keep Windows updated and... uh, and uh, you'll be okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they just had five other miscellaneous security things. Sure. Nothing. No uh, big deal. Uh, re- privately re- reported vulnerabilities. Um, interestingly, RSA, you know, the inventors of, of it, well, the pioneers of early um, asymmetric crypto and famous RSA, um, have been warning of an impending attack on online banking um, in a post from, I guess it was actually last week, um, their their head of cybercrime communications, uh, Moore Hovia, Ahuvia, um, he wrote, in one of the most interesting cases of organized cybercrime this year, a cyber gang has recently communicated its plans. Now, they, they've been monitoring this quietly and sort of in the same way that Brian Krebs has established himself and is sort of, you know, part of that underground so he can see what's going on. A cyber gang has recently communicated its plans to launch a Trojan attack spree on 30 American banks as oh, part of great. a large... Yeah. As part of a large Don't scale mind the grinding. Or- I'm just making my coffee. I <laughs> Okay. I'll turn off the mic. As, as part of a large-scale orchestrated cyber crime uh, campaign planned for this fall, so coming to you before the holidays, the Blitzkrieg-like series of Trojan attacks is set to be carried out by approximately 100 botmasters who therefore are independently running about 100 um, bot networks. RSA believes this is the making of the most substantial organized banking Trojan operation seen to date. And remember, this is RSA blogging this. This is not some, you know, random nobody. They said by investigating the group's forum post announcement and analyzing the Trojan, RSA has managed to link the cyber gang's weapon of choice to a little known proprietary Gozi-like Trojan, as G-O-Z-I, which RSA has dubbed Gozi Prinimalka, derived from the Russian word meaning to receive and alluding to a Trojan drop point. The word Prinimalka appears as a folder name in every URL path given by the gang over the years to its cyber crime servers. 
According to underground chatter, which RSA has been monitoring, the gang plans to deploy the Trojan in an effort to complete fraudulent wire transfers via man-in-the-middle manual session hijacking scenarios. We've talked in the past about how that works, where if you've got something that has infected your local machine, as these Trojan bots would, then they're they're intercepting your browser's communication to your bank prior to it being encrypted and sent over the net. So, you know, this is not a man in the middle decrypting your SSL communications. This is a man just on the other side of your keyboard and screen, you know, closer to you really than the middle. Um, but <laughs> Man over point, your shoulder, really. <laughs> man peering exactly cyber-wise over your shoulder. And they said previous incidents involving this Gozi Trojan handled by RSA and other information security vendors appear to corroborate the gang's claims that since 2008, their Trojan has been at the source of siphoning $5 million from American bank accounts. Gozi Prinimalka's similarity to the Gozi Trojan, both in technical terms and its operational aspects, suggests that the hang-up team, a group that was previously known to launch Gozi infection campaigns or a group closely affiliated with it, may be the troop behind this ambitious scheme. Wow. If successfully launched, the full force of this mega heist may only be felt by targeted banks in a month or two. The spree's longevity, in turn, will depend on how fast banks and their security teams implement countermeasures against the heretofore secret banking Trojan. Not to so, put it down or anything, but it, $5 million in five years is not like, I mean... Correct. <laughs> Uh, it's, it almost sounds like the scheme in off in office space where they were skimming pennies off the top, kind of. Well, and remember too that they're they don't have any control over whom they infect and over right. over the quality. So it's hit of or miss. Yeah, right. It's yeah. it's hit or miss. Uh, the the Trojan may not be able to intercept the bank that that particular person who is infected by it deals with and they may not have much money to lose so you know i mean if right. there's not anything in their checking account except you know low level transactional amounts that's all they're able to get so um anyway this what rsa is talking about is you know they're seeing the chatter hmm. in the forums as these groups organize and apparently they're they're actually looking for quote investors unquote <laughs> who who would be who would be fronting the money to build the back-end infrastructure to accept the payments and process them once they've been oh, yeah. they've been transferred. Sure, they need a fence. Yes, exactly. So to speak. Crazy. Um, oh, also, Adobe, um, Monday of this week, a couple days ago, uh, did an emergency out-of-cycle update to Flash, fixing 25 security vulnerabilities, and an hour later, Microsoft released news of their update to the Flash player, which is now bound into IE10 because with Flash having been such a success in the security space, why wouldn't you just build it right into your <laughs> browser? Now, it's built into Chrome, but it's, but it's sandboxed. Yeah, and automatically updated. Well, see, this is the problem, Steve. I mean, you may not, we may not like Flash, but everybody needs it and uses it, so they're going to install it eventually. Right. It's it's probably going to. You're right. It's so gonna better get to do way. it this way. There are still enough sites on the net which require Flash that you're going to end up with it in your browser. I mean, you're I wish right. it would go I mean, away, but uh, it's here to stay, uh, not to stay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and anyone with an iPad is annoyed right. by their lack of flash frankly right. you know on on the iPad because you do you you're away from your main machine somewhere being mobile and you come to a site that is just dead without flash so it's like okay well i know i wish we were migrating to html5 more quickly but anyway same so, with java too by the way yeah that's true that's absolutely right and so microsoft 
has been in the past criticized for their lack of speed. In this case, they were only 60 minutes lagging uh, Adobe. So one can hope that if they're going to have Flash bundled in, they'll be taking responsibility for it as as they seem to be doing now with IE10 um, and and being much more quick about updating. And in another little blurb, this got past me a few weeks ago, and I meant to bring it up, but and I, then I was, I think someone else must have tweeted it to me. I went, oh, that's right. I forgot to mention this. Um, okay. <laughs> Every fingerprint reader on laptops everywhere comes from the same company, UPEK. UPEC. UPEC. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, I'm a big Lenovo user uh, for my laptops, and I've, I, I like the fingerprint scanner. We've talked about how nice it is to sort of drag your finger over the little capacitive reader, and it logs you in, you know, and unlocks the BIOS, logs you into Windows, and so forth. And it's like, oh, look, we've got multi factor. Well, um, a, a security company, Elcom Soft, E L C O M S O F T, just noted back in August that uh, there was a problem <laughs> with UPEX software because when you're setting it up and giving it the ability to log you into Windows, you need to give it your credentials. Now, the assumption is, and unfortunately that turns out to have been all it is, is that they would do something secure with those credentials. It turns out they're stored in the registry not very well encrypted. Elcomsoft did not disclose any details, but they put out a warning that for what it's worth, anyone using any biometric fingerprint reader with UPEC software, and I remember when I saw this, it was the who's who of laptops. I mean, all the laptops, and there was Lenovo, of course, listed, and all the other ones, uh, because this is the company that cornered the market on fingerprint software, and nobody else seems to have thought it was worth competing with them. So last week, a security researcher, Adam Caudill, he described himself as he uh, on, on his website, he blogged, and, and in his description, he says, I'm a software developer, pen tester, meaning penetration tester, and manager. I'm currently located in southern Virginia. I write about development, security, and anything else that I find interesting. From Microsoft's .NET stack to Ruby, security, and exploits, and even a little about photography and lasers. So he blogged on August 28th, Elcomsoft announced that they had determined a method to extract Windows passwords from the registry of users of UPEX fingerprint readers and protector suite software. And he says in, in parens, UPEC is now owned by Authentech, which is now owned by Apple. What they did Apple announce, computer? That's <laughs> I did I I didn't verify that. Apple doesn't even it. have any fingerprint reading hardware. Isn't that interesting? That's bizarre. So, but Authentech does other things. They must do other. So, oh, yeah, yeah. That's kind of, that name sounds familiar. Huh. Yeah, it does. He says, what they didn't announce was the technical details of how they did it. Um, myself, he writes, and Brandon Wilson have been working to recreate their research, and we have. We have not been in contact with Elcomsoft, so this is an independent rediscovery of this vulnerability. Of course, they also knew where to look from what Alcomsoft wrote. He says, Alcomsoft has committed to not release details, which I understand. But given how widely and well, given how likely it is that others will determine this technique, I believe that this information should be available to penetration testers and auditors so that these insecure credentials can be identified. Adam then goes on to describe this in detail. So it's a D A M C A U D I L L dot com. Adam Caudill dot com. Uh, if anyone go, just go there um, and look at his blog if you're interested. 
I'll give a brief summary of what he found, and that is that there was crypto applied, but the, but UPEC says, and he found, that they just sort of made up their own. And we always know that's never a good idea. They have what they call AES-56. And it's like, wait, there is no such thing as AES-56. So there's AES-256, of course. Well, what they did, apparently, because they operate on an international scale, they needed to comply with international export restrictions or they needed their software to be able to operate within countries that 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 legislatively restrict the security of software. So even though it's not a problem, for example, in the U.S., they have one solution global. And what they did was simply pad all of the other 200 bits of AES-256 with zeros, drastically weakening the crypto. <laughs> That's moronic. <laughs> it's actually moronic. Oh, uh, and so... I mean, it would have been so, better to use. Well, that's just moronic. It'd be better to do anything. anything. I mean, you could use triple DES, for example. Would have. Been, I mean, this ends up being. Is it because extreme? they don't have hardware to do the calculation? Uh, no, it's just be, it, the only reason, the only rationale that makes sense is that that they did this for export restrictions in order to comply ah. with export restrictions. Because there are, there is legislation. Um, in some jurisdictions, which state that you cannot, you not, you cannot use crypto greater than fifty-six bits, because the, you know, the 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 powers that be within those regions are able to crack that, and so what ended up happening was that without even understanding all of this, Adam and his buddy Brandon knew where to look because Elkham Soft had provided enough breadcrumbs for that. And they just independently cracked it. So on his blog posting, he provides all the details. So, so the takeaway, of course, for our listeners is that we should not overly rely on the security of these fingerprint readers. But more importantly, in providing this information to the fingerprint software to allow it to log us into Windows – we have inadvertently dramatically weakened the security of the system because this is now widely known. And so if malware gets into our machine, it will know where to look to see if we happen to be on a laptop with a fingerprint reader and UPEC software and they could grab the key and then decrypt it and get our Windows credentials, which there otherwise isn't a simple way to achieve so this is not good um hmm. you know so it is a it, it's a classic uh, what i liked about this as a lesson for for the, our security now listeners is this is a this is a classic case of of a bad implementation of a potentially secure technology which which where the implementation results in greater weakness right. than if you had never used it in the first place. Well, and we saw that uh, a couple of weeks ago where they were storing passwords in the clear in the registry, right? So this is the yeah. second flaw. I don't know if it's the same company, but the second flaw with fingerprint. Yeah, readers. this is well, this is in the clear. Um, well, this is not. I'm sorry, this is not, it's not in, in the clear, clear but it's just stupid this encryption. Is weak, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's badly you know, encrypted. Weak roll your own encryption. <laughs> And and the point is that it you end up with worse protection because you now have your Windows logon right. credentials Story. badly right. encrypted in a way that everyone understands sitting in the registry. That's norm. That's normally never the case. Right. So you know, essentially, you told the software how to log you into Windows, and it didn't. It's not protecting that from anything that had access to the registry. So any malware that got into your system could look to see if this was there and and acquire your Windows credentials that way. So that's not good. If I guess if if so if this is of of concern to someone, then what you have to do 
is stop using UPEX fingerprint reader software. I would check in with Authentech and look for updates or news. They're not saying anything. People have asked Authentech what they think, and so far, no official response from them. So until this gets fixed, what you would want to do is change your Windows password, your your logon credentials, and don't tell the UPEC fingerprint reader about it. You know, disable right. its logon because it cannot be you trusted. don't want to use that anymore. Yeah, you can't trust it. You can't you can't tell it what your new credentials are. And then once this gets updated, as I'm it's got to be updated. There's I'm, I would imagine somebody's working on this now, then uh and then you could move forward. And Dr. Mom wonders because fingerprint uh, readers are routinely used in things like uh, pharmacies and hospitals to uh, keep unauthorized people from taking medication. Um, if this applies to other fingerprint scanners, uh, no, it would just be just it would Windows. just be Windows with this UPEC software. In fact, I, I mentioned before the podcast, Leo, that I was was helping a neighbor who needed some medical care yesterday and I I was watching the security in ER and when the I, I thought it was interesting of when the nurse <laughs> <laughs> when the nurse she dialed in the uh the a- automated um IV metering and I watched her scan her badge and have her have her thumb scanned in in order to take responsibility for what, you know, exactly. essentially log into the fact exactly. that she had just been the person who set this up. Right. So it's like, oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's, but, I think, what Dr. No, Mom's But no problem. About. Just Windows. Just Windows. As long as they're not yeah. using Windows. Uh, yes. With, with Internet access. <laughs> and I did run across a uh, a nice note from a listener uh, who, uh, who ended up posing a question uh, that I thought our listener would find interesting. Uh, Robert Osor... Osorio, O-S-O-R-I-O, in Lady Lake, Florida, uh, he said uh, the subject was another SSD slash Spinrite testimonial. He said, Steve, just to let you know that you can add me to the list of Spinrite users who have found Spinrite useful for reviving SSD drives. Hmm. I'm an IT consultant and have been using Spinrite for a couple of decades. Wow. I have an older Intel X25-M, which is very nice, SSD drive, that was the boot drive from my main workstation. I recently upgraded to a much faster SSD and relegated the old Intel drive to a laptop. However, in time, I started getting OS issues that, on a spinning drive, would have indicated bad sectors and would have had me running Spinrite on it immediately. Since this was an SSD, I thought all I could do was update the firmware, which I did, and it did help for a while, or I could just write off the drive. Then I heard you mention on a recent podcast that running Spinrite Level 1 on an SSD could help, so I gave it a shot. It made a dramatic difference, and now this drive is running smoothly once again. I have now run Spinrite Level 1 on all my SSDs and will continue to do so on a regular basis for preventative maintenance. I read, he says, parens, I religiously run Spinrite Level 4 on all my spinning drives every six months or so as well. I did want to get a clarification from you, and I'm sure other listeners would appreciate this as well. You recently read a testimonial from someone who re- recovered an unreadable flash drive using Spinrite Level 2, and you indicated that was a valid procedure. Am I correct in assuming then that it's okay to run Level 2 on an SSD or flash drive for preventative maintenance? Or should I use Level 1 for preventative maintenance and Level 2 for data recovery only? My concern is avoiding excess writes, which would prematurely wear out the memory cells, thus your admonition against running level four on solid state media since it performs aggressive writes. Reading from your documentation, it appears that level two is only performing writes if it recovers data from a damaged sector and then has the drive relocated. 
As such, it seems that level two is not much more aggressive on writes than level one and should be safe to use on a regular basis on SSDs. Thanks again for a great product and a great podcast. And Robert's exactly right. Um, the difference between level one and two is that level two, level two will perform some pattern testing on the area, so doing some writing if it runs across a problem. Um, and that's probably more useful on magnetic physical drives than on SSDs. So I would advise using level one, which is sufficient on SSDs, um, where you want a read-only process. Level two makes more sense on magnetic drives, where you you want maximum speed and just a read pass over the drive, and then Spinrite will do more work um, with with um, testing the surface if you end up with a problem at level two, which it does not do at level one. Level one is is meant to be just a a a read permission only pass. We'll remember that a week or two ago I read a note about Spinrite recovering data even when it was run at level one, but that was the drive essentially doing the recovery, not spin right. And with smart drives now, uh, that can happen. So again, level one for SSDs, level two for hard drives. And uh, it's great to see more evidence that spin right can be useful on SSDs because, of course, that's where the world is headed at some speed. Yeah, it's currently good for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, good. Well, I'm not yeah. surprised. I mean, I guess it just means that there's certain things it can't, uh, it couldn't do. Well, that you know, the the fact is, SSDs actually share a surprising chunk of hard drive technology. There is error correction going on because those cells, unfortunately, are, or I guess, well, yeah, unfortunately, are being downsized to the smallest degree possible or downsized to the greatest degree to make them as small as possible in order to get the highest density to be competitive. So it's the same kind of problem where hard drives are less than completely reliable due to, you know, purely due to competitive pressure to s squeeze as many bits as possible into the smallest cost possible. In the case of SSDs, what that means is that the, 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 the size of the tank which is storing the charge, which is remembering whether that's a one or a zero bit, they, they've just made that incredibly small. And so they've made it so small that you are then relying on error correction to sort of pull you out of the gray area. There's like – there's gray, unfortunately, now designed into these SSDs because – they figured that's the right trade-off to make. And so, so something like Spinrite, well, actually, there is nothing else like Spinrite. So Spinrite um, is able to, to make a read pass over the SSD, show it that, the, okay, this is becoming, you know, too gray, essentially. Not clearly white, not, not clearly black or white, but a little too gray. And so the, then the SSD controller says, uh-oh, and will will either rewrite that data to strengthen it, or if it doesn't look like it's safe, it will, will essentially map that out and, and map in um, new space. So, I mean, it's very much like the way hard drives have evolved. They just don't spin. Right. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons they're fast. But hey, I'm before still we call it spin right, Leo. I don't know how I can change the name. Mm. Even though nothing is spinning, it's Static still spin right. right. Yeah, no, spin right. right. It's spin right. It's spin <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Hey, let's talk a little bit about audible.com. Then we get the uh, questions for everybody, uh, from everybody. But uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about a special deal going on. Uh, right now from audible.com. We have the uh, the usual Audible deal at audiblepodcast.com slash security. Now, the gold plan, you sign up for a book a month and your first month's free. Your first credit is free. You could use it for almost any of the 100,000 plus books at audible.com, including the Honor Harrington series. If you uh, have been listening to Steve and you want to uh, get started with Honor Harrington, they're all on here. Yay. Uh, yeah. 
How many? Th- uh, they've got 13, I think. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. They're really good. You would start probably with On Basilisk Station, which is the That's first the of the Honor Harrington books. But there's also, I mean, there's great stuff from our friend Peter F. Hamilton. I wish you were my friend. Peter oh. F. Hamilton, our favorite, one of our favorite authors. Um, we, we've recommended <laughs> in the past that you start with uh, his shorter books. Let me go back here. Somebody uh, with that name tweets me from time to time, and I always get excited. It's oh, like, oh, okay, well, wouldn't that be nice? Right. Look at all the Peter F. <laughs> Hamilton they have, including the trilogies. Um, uh, it's just a tough choice, but that's what's beautiful about Audible.com. Now, Audible uh, works, by the way, on your iPhone, your uh, Android phone. Get the apps designed for those platforms, Windows Phone too, because then you get all sorts of additional benefits, including Whisper Sync, which means it'll jump on any device to where you last left off on any other device, including in some... Whisper Sync for audio books, uh, your Kindle. Oh, I see the new Pete Townsend autobiography is out. I really am dying to read this. This will be my next uh, Audible pick. But here we got something special for you, a free book. You don't even have to sign up for an account for anybody who wants one at audible.com slash Sanderson. They're offering a novella. Uh, You probably will like this. I just downloaded it. I'm really enjoying it. It's kind of a sci-fi fantasy. Um... The story is about Stephen Leeds, a.k.a. Legion, the title of the book. He uh, has a unique mental condition that allows him to generate many personae, hallucinatory entities with a wide variety of personal characteristics and highly specialized skills. It sounds really cool. I've downloaded it, and I haven't started it yet. I'll probably start it this evening. So this is free for everybody right now at audible.com slash Sanderson. Audible.com slash Sanderson. That's completely independent. You don't have to have an account. You don't have to sign up for anything. Just get it. It's a great way to start listening uh, to uh, uh, audiobooks and you, with no obligation. Audible.com slash Sanderson. And if you want another book, now you get two. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now. How about that? Two for one. I love Audible. I know you will too. Start listening today at audiblepodcast.com slash security now are you ready steve you betcha <laughs> you got your thinking cap on let's go to our uh, questions as proposed by steve gibson who's collected them from his feedback form at grc.com starting with carl ballstad in seattle washington he declares and i'm happy to happy to hear this one carbonite wins thank you for putting this one in hi steve and leo i've been enjoying the security now podcast since the beginning I'm about three months behind right now. I've also been a Jungle Disk user like you, Steve, until recently. When I had to reinstall Jungle Disk because it wasn't working anymore on my XP machine, I discovered it wouldn't install at all. So I went to the website to post a help ticket and was shocked at all the complaints and not getting any response from the Jungle Disk staff. It got got sold, right? Yeah. And and, what happened was what we worried was going to happen, apparently. It fell off the face of the earth. So I started looking for a new online backup solution. Luckily for me, you'd recently done a podcast on exactly that. I tried several of the ones you recommended. By the way, that's a great show where you just list all of the uh, cloud storage solutions, pros and, and cons. And go through them all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the end, I just couldn't resist Carbonite's plan of just backing up all the user files on the internal drive without worrying about how big it may be or how much your backup will be costing this month. It's less than five bucks a month for everything. It's such a relief to know that everything's backed up. The only time I'll have to worry about it is if my hard drive fills up. Thought you and Carbonite might like to know. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for the great podcast. It's amazing. It's still relevant and entertaining after all these years. Carbonite, of course, is one of our uh, sponsors, and uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate that. Well, and I did, uh, I've also, the thing that caught my eye, not only was that, um, you know, he appreciated the the cloud storage podcast we did, and that he chose Carbonite, and his his rationale for doing so, but I have had a bunch of people complaining about Jungle Disk. Um, That's you know, sad. Our, our our listeners that we we remember it was Dave. I remember he called himself Jungle Dave. Jungle Dave. That's right. And you know, he was the founder and creator and evangelist. And I'm sure it was good for him that he was able to sell Jungle Disk. But um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's been good for. Some of its long-term or long-time users. So, I was sorry to hear that, but uh, there are alternatives now. So, yeah, do listen to that show because everything has it. You know, there's pros and cons on all of the things. And yes, while Carbonite's a sponsor. It's not necessarily the right choice for everybody. Um, 
Some people prefer well, pay as you go. Some people want to have external drives, and there's all sorts of things. Yeah, and we we know that we do not have a homogeneous set of users. Exactly. We've got all kind of exactly. varying skills, various needs, varying you know configurations. You know, some people want to get things remotely. Some things, some people want web access. I mean, so there are you know there is a spectrum of different solutions available. Yep. Our next question from Scott Reeves in Phoenix. He shares his OAuth Facebook login idea. I heard last week's Q&A where you discussed your concerns with the Facebook login spoofing, and I had an idea. What if Facebook combined their login with a captcha of several of your friends' faces? Hey, that's a good point. They know our friends, don't they? People could instantly recognize friends' faces in theory, and it would be very difficult for bad guys to spoof. I don't think it'd be much of a burden on users to recognize their friends as long as it wasn't somehow taken as a product endorsement. Thoughts? Hey, I like that idea. It's a cool idea. I mean, this this follows on the very valid point that I think was raised uh, that one of our listeners raised, uh, probably Q&A, the last Q&A we did, was where the point was made that when, you, you know, what's what's becoming very much in vogue is when you go to a site and it says, oh, would you like to log in using your Twitter ID or your Facebook ID or, you know, one of the other accounts that you probably frequently use. And so uh, because it's such a simple and, and easy thing to do, rather than create a new account in that other place, you know, people are doing that a lot. They just say, yeah, I want to use my, my Facebook login. So that's uh, the danger is that that you know you're you're clicking on that site it's bouncing you to to over to facebook to authenticate and the problem comes that if that site were malicious it could easily bounce you to a facebook clone login and then capture your authentic facebook data and so what scott noted is that and, and i i was put in mind of leo i think it was your b of a Remember years ago when they were like showing you some picture Psych that you key. had. They still do it. Okay, and the problem there is that that um, you're having to provide them with that or choose from among a grid you of choose. like kitten, yeah. Yeah. puppies or kittens or yeah. whatever yeah, they exactly. you know giraffes. Um, and here, Facebook does have does have information that they could show you that that you could expect them to be able to show you. Now, this is a good idea, and, and I like this. The problem is that, again, the, it's the naive user that we're trying to to protect themselves from. And I just don't, you know, I mean, this, this puts me back in mind of recognizing that there is always going to be a tension and a problem between convenience and security. And this notion of, of one click bounce to another site, it is really convenient. But I don't think there's a way to make it secure. What Scott pr suggests is a nice idea. And again, you know, it's worth doing things that improve security, even if we can't get to 100%. And I don't, I don't think we're going to get to 100%. Hmm. But it's neat to make it better. Yeah. No, we're never going to get to 100%. You could think of man in the middle attacks and stuff like that. Oh. Keith Takayesu in Ottawa, Canada, wonders about breaking passwords into bits. Steve, I love your show. Thought you might be interested in this article. It's from uh, the MIT Technology Review. To keep passwords safe from hackers, just break them into bits. And, a number uh, it's of a people, long URL, but yeah, yeah, a number of people picked up on this um, and were tweeting it to me. So I bet you Ars Technica and other people also. Uh, grab you know picked up on the story so it's probably around a bit this actually is what I was referring to at the top of the show about RSA having developed something that they called distributed credential protection and and the short version of it I mean it is deep crypto but they the idea is do not store well, it's exactly what it sounds like. Distributed creten distribu <laughs> I'm tripping over this. Distributed credential protection. So do not store all of the information about a person's credentials, like their login password credentials, 
on a single machine. Arrange to spread it around so that so that in order to obtain all the credential information, you would have to to attack multiple different servers. And they even talk about um, in, in their description of this, RSA's description, that you could have the credentials stored on different OS platforms so that, so again, even if there was a vulnerability that affected one OS, it wouldn't be applicable across their distributed protection suite. And there's additional technology which apparently changes the way the credential is distributed among its different nodes over time. So if you attacked one, one of these nodes that had part of the credential and then later attacked another node, the fact that it hadn't all been done at the same time would also prevent it from working. Now, RSA has, apl has, has applied this for their own use and they're going to be offering it on some terms for sale in the future um, to to enable companies to protect, to better protect themselves, I'm I'm a little skeptical about what this will really mean in the real world. I mean, this is cool technology, and in fact, we've discussed something like this many many moons ago. I remember when we were talking about like it was how could you how could you control access to information by a group of people where you want more than one person to be required to access something. Yeah, it was like, yet, if I die, I'll give half my password to my attorney, the other yes, half to yes. and, my Yes, and for example, say that you had, you had three people and you wanted, you wanted access to, be, to require any two. So you would take a really long password... And you'd break it into three pieces mm -hmm. and you give the, the first and the second piece to the first person, the second and the third piece to the second person and the first and the third piece to the third person. So each of those people is missing one of the important pieces, a different important piece, yet any two of them are able to to re form the entire unbroken password. So, you know, it's, it's you know, we've talked about this kind of thing. Uh, I'm glad, actually, because I'm sure that RSA has got patent protection on this. The good news is enough similar things like this has have been done before that, you know, RSA is not going to be able to corner the market on, on this approach. And, you know, I guess I think this is a good thing that they've done. But I mean, look at the companies that are still just storing things in the clear or still saying, oh, no, you can only have a 10 character password yeah. and it has to be all lowercase. I mean, we have a long way to go before we even need something like, you know, distributed credential protection. It's nice to know that it's there. And for high value login, for example, certificate authorities that really want to protect themselves, you know, there are certainly instances of companies that that are looking for the best protection available. And, you know, I would imagine, you know, this this would make sense for them, whereas so many other companies just haven't even woken up to the idea. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Question four, uh, Michael Walther in Berlin. Well, a famous uh, German name. I wonder if he's related to the Walther PPK. <laughs> Wonders no NFC. Are you are you sure? Is too sure? From what I found out so far from the A6 chip and the iPhone 5, I'm pretty sure it does have NFC. It's integrated in the A6 chip, waiting to be released via software, thus giving Samsung a harder time to clone it. Just my two cents. Yeah, it's not. Uh, so there's uh, some. He's got it wrong. <laughs> Okay, I was into. I, I thought maybe you would know. I yeah. poked around and looked to see if I could find any confirmation of that rumor. First of all, and I it's did not. It's not. So the deal is that uh, Apple is is using a custom fab that's based on an ARM V7s platform, but it's completely custom fab. 
So unless he has a very good inside source at Apple, because I think this is probably guarded like the Fort Knox, about what they've put in the chip, it is not a standard ARM implementation. So is he basing that on a standard ARM implementation? Because it's I don't see where he, where he where he where he would get that information. Yeah. Um it, it caught my attention and my imagination because I love the idea of it being there but unimplemented so that at some point it's well, it, it could be, you know, in does a Does it in need a future... to be uh, implemented at that level anyway? I mean, isn't it just software? Um, no, there would have to be... It would have to be a little radio somewhere. Yeah, that would not in the a, not in the system on a chip. It would be a. It would be a, It would be asleep right now. Yeah. Um, and then, I, of course, the the other counter argument to that is, you know, as the uh, as the Samsung commercials are making very clear at the moment, Apple really does like to drag its users forward, phone by phone by phone. It's your parents' phone. <laughs> it's apparently what Samsung wants you to think. So. Yeah, and so so I, I mean, and and the fact is, Apple may very well at some future time add NFC and use that as the reason to upgrade to iPhone, what nine, right, or ten, whatever right. they are at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. Uh, a, I think he's just mistaken about the capability of the chip. I certainly don't think we could know, but. Um, it needs to have some more hardware put in there, including a, a radio, which is not in there. Right. So even if it were in the chip, they'd have to make an iPhone 5S or a 5N or something to with a Yeah, with a and radio. actually, you know, as as we discussed last week, NFC requires a, a short, small wire loop antenna. And that's the – it has to have – a magnetic, an electromagnetic field to radiate. It has to be a multi-turn wire loop per the spec and per the frequency and and radiation characteristics. And there's no way, there's no obvious way to conceal that. Right. So anybody who would who did a you know an I, a, an I fix it take it's apart been torn deal. apart. Yeah. There's no yeah. antenna. There yeah. also is the issue of this being an aluminum back. Uh, and of course, NFC does not go through metal, so uh, Samsung and others have plastic backs um, in order to solve that problem. In order to solve that problem. So, in fact, once people saw the case, they said, "Oh, well, I guess Apple's not going to do NFC." We knew this because there's you could, I guess, you could put it at the top or the bottom where there's still. Uh, plastic, you could also, but... you know, you, you you could bump faces rather than bump butts. Right. You could do it for because you know. I mean, it is a radio. The phone right. itself is a radio. So right. it's there's ways to able... get signals out. Yeah, RF. Right. Out. Yeah, that's right. a good point. Uh, anyway, there's no there's no transmitter. There's no radio. There's no antenna. So there's no way they could just flip a software switch and make this thing NFC capable. Sorry, bad news. Russell in London with a tip for Verizon users. Web history. Oh, you know what? I just heard about this, and I am shocked. I'm so glad he brought this up. Colin uh, Weir, our uh, streaming engineer, or no, I'm sorry, it was Josh Windish, uh, just told me this. Verizon customers have 30 days. I I would I hope that you've looked into this because maybe it's just a you know Snopes worthy. But according to the rumor going on the net, Verizon customers have 30 days to opt out. To opt out from yep. Verizon selling your web history and device location history to marketers. Now I am a Verizon customer so i went to www.vzw.com slash my privacy what i found was a a page that said customer proprietary network information settings verizon wireless and its affiliates parens the verizon companies Provide services to you. Holy cow. In a, uh, <laughs> I, this is the default is on. It's, oh yes, my it is. God. In doing so, we may collect certain information that is made available to us solely by virtue of our relationship with you. Holy cow. Such as quantity, technical configuration, type, destination, location, and amount of use of the telecommunication services you purchase. This information and related billing information is known as 
customer proprietary network information, parens CPNI. The Federal Communications Commission and other regulators require the Verizon companies collectively to protect your CPNI in order to better serve your communication needs and to identify, offer, and provide products and services to meet your requirements, we need your permission to share this information among our affiliates, agents, and parent companies, parens including Vodafone, and their subsidiaries. So on that page, after I logged in, it showed my two cell phone numbers, one for my BlackBerry, the other for my iPhone 4. And both of them were set to OK to share my CPNI. Jeez. And so Mine was too. I, had, I just went there. I've never seen it before. Yep. Holy cow. It's, yep. So anyway, for any of our Verizon listeners, vzw.com slash myprivacy will get you to a login page, log in, and then if you choose to say, uh, don't share my CPNI, you can select that and save that setting. So Apparently you, this Russell. has been going on for a while, although I had not heard of it. Now, I don't, I just got a Verizon iPhone, so I wouldn't have known about it um, until now, but I've had a Verizon account for years, so apparently they've been doing this all along. That's yeah. shocking. That's just shocking. It's not, well, I mean, you know, it's one thing. I think Facebook and Google, which offer free services and need to monetize, that's one thing. I'm paying a hell of a lot of money yes. to use this Verizon service. They make plenty of money off of me. And uh, for well, them and to... Selling, th and selling your location. It's like ooh. horrible. Wow. Well, I just decided not to, uh, you know, I was, I was waiting on the Galaxy Note 2 because I wanted to get a Verizon one. No. Nope. <laughs> Although I, I wonder if AT and T is doing the same thing. Maybe Verizon's to be praised for at least telling people they're doing this and giving yeah, them a way to opt you, out. Giving you an opt out. Yeah. Is, I, does anybody know? By the way, uh, relevant mobile advertising right below it is defaulted on. It's okay to use my demographic info for banners. I mean, there's stuff you may want to look at here. <laughs> at least it's all on one page. Yeah. Business and marketing reports okay to use my information for aggregate. I guess aggregates okay. I don't know. I don't. I'm going to opt out of it all as long as I can. I'm paying these guys. They don't. They're, they're, yeah, I think. I think if nothing else, expressing our sentiment is a useful yeah. thing to do. Saying, uh, "No, I'm." You know, you you get a hundred plus bucks a month from me. Yeah, That's you don't more sell than you stuff. need. Yeah, don't sell my yeah. stuff to make more. <sighs> yeah. Good. Let's see. AT and T. Uh, the chat room has given me a link for AT and T too. It's a longer link, not as easy. Ooh. Uh, customer proprietary network information restriction request. They're doing the same thing. Yep, CPNI. CPNI. You have to complete and submit a form to restrict oh. AT&T's use of your customer proprietary network information. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and lick the stamp. Yeah. Oh. Bet, yeah. So, you know what? Kudos to Verizon, because both Verizon and AT&T are obviously doing the same thing. Yep. Well, that means probably everybody. Which means everybody is. Which means, really, we should praise Verizon for at least giving us a checkbox. Yes, and, <laughs> and letting us do it And sending us an email. Seconds. Yeah. Yep. Holy cow. That sucks. <laughs> and you have to do it for each of your AT&T numbers, by the way. Yeah, I had uh, I there actually on the top is all in in the case of Verizon, it says all they cell phone numbers. They show you them all, so but in AT and T, I have to know my numbers, go through them, and uh, one by one check them. Multiple Jeez, stamps so. to lick. <sighs> Rethink possible. We were unable to match the account <laughs> and zip code. Oh, they they are evil, <laughs> evil, evil, evil. Oh, it's not your phone number; it's your customer ID. Go ahead and f try to find that. Oh, yeah. Holy cow. Thank you for uh, bringing that one up, Steve. Shocking. And and Russell in London. I wonder how Russell yes. in London knows. Maybe it's London, on, maybe it's London, U.S. Maybe it's New London. I don't... He Lance, just said London. London, I presume England. He's an expert on U.S. privacy issues. Lance Reichert, who is recrossing the Adirondacks. <laughs> 
wonders about hashing speed improvements. That's what happens when you go on long walks. Well, I'm, you know, got to get back to the other side. So, <laughs> Announcing new faster secure hash. A couple of months ago, you were discussing hashed storage of passwords, emphasizing that proper storage used hundreds, if not thousands, of rounds of hashing to make the generation of rainbow tables prohibitively expensive. This makes sense. But in the Security Now episodes, both before and after the announcement of the new SHA-3 algorithm, it seemed that its chief benefit was it's faster than the existing SHA-256. Surely the fact that Ketchak has little in common with SHA-2 is a good thing, but have we stepped backwards as regards throughput? Lance, professional nitpicker and itinerant engineer. So this gave me a, a, an opportunity just to, first of all, address Lance's point and to, to expand a little bit on, on the issue of strengthening that aspect of password testing. We, we've, we've sort of gone beyond the point where what, what Lance points to is a problem. Um, I think it is a very good thing that we have a – strong, chosen, standard, agreed upon next generation hash, which also has the benefit of being being fast to implement in hardware and running faster and every bit as securely, we believe, as our current standard. Um, we've solved the problem of speed by by uh, by by replacing iteration um, with, um, well, by using iteration in order to deliberately slow the process down. Um, one of the tools that many people use is called, is a, is a tool called Bcrypt, B, the letter B, C-R-Y-P-T. B, Bcrypt is often cited as a, as a solution because by design, they start with, a very slow process. They actually use Blowfish, which was Bruce Schneier's um, invention. Uh, uh, that predated Two Fish, which predates Three Fish, and you know Red Fish, Blue Fish. Anyway, um, and and the reason they chose Blowfish is that it has a very slow. Um, um, key setup phase. So remember that with, with all of these symmet uh, symmetric ciphers, you you there there there's a before you can actually do any encrypting, you've got to feed in the key, and it's normally expanded to create a a much larger array of bits, which are then mixed in as the cipher iterates in order to perform its crypto function. In the case of Blowfish, that's very that's a very slow process. So Bcrypt was is deliberately designed to strengthen password hashing. But the cool thing about it is it's de it's designed to be scalable from the beginning so that as machines get faster, as GPUs get faster, as we continue this obvious evolution towards ever greater speeds, you can simply and easily turn up the number of iterations in, in a smooth fashion. Now, you don't need Bcrypt to do that. You can use any iterative secure hash. And, and what's, what's cool is that there's nothing to prevent you from storing the iteration count along with the hash. So, for example, so, so what's stored in the database is here's the hash that resulted from here's how many iterations. And so, so th that doesn't weaken the security at all to say this is how many times we iterated the user provide password in order to result in this hash, which means that it's trivial for servers to, to scale themselves up so that as they get faster and as the technology evolves, we just iterate more. Now, it's true that if you have a faster hash, that iteration count needs to scale appropriately, but who cares? You're basically tying up your machine for, for a certain amount of time 
which is a burden for the good guys because you have to do that every time you need to authenticate. But that's much less often than a bad guy who's trying to do, you know, millions and billions of guesses of a password who then has to iterate all of that many times for every single guess. So anyway, it's it certainly changes the the iteration count for hashing if we get a faster hash. But at this point, we, we, we should be, and for all intents and purposes are, we're past the point of, of not iterating when security is set up correctly. So it really doesn't matter. We just iterate more on a faster hash. Speaking of hash, I'm just going to grind some more... Uh... <laughs> you grind away, Leo. This is really cool. I don't, you know, uh, I have a, I have, a, I have a. I love the idea of a, of a hand burr grinder. Well, you That's know, neat. it is. It's burr, and it looks like it's ceramic in there. I mean, it's beautiful. Nice. It really is beautiful. Nice. And there's a certain, and it smells good. There's a certain joy. Should we send one to Steve? Steve, should do the ad next week. Steve we're going to send this down to you. Oh, cool. well, you already have. Well, we'll send down. You could do the ad next week. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have probably opened this because then we could have sent it as a gift box, but we'll repack it up. Hey, I don't mind if it's regifting. Mm, that's fine. It smells good too. That I mean, that's kind of yeah. I like that. That's cool. Speaking of hash, Ricardo in Brazil, Brazil wonders and worries about the NFC threat we talked about last week. Steve, I was very concerned about what you said. You talked about NFC being a new surface of attack for mobile phones. True. But I think you left out an important characteristic of NFC, which is to potentially replace all the contra contactless cards, that is, you know, the standard credit cards we may already have in our position, payment cards, corporate facilities, entrance badges, transport cards, and so on. The interesting thing about NFC is the presence of a secure element, which is a microprocessor with an application behind it that interprets commands coming from the reader and acts upon it, even by rejecting the command should... Uh, there be a failed mutual authentication. So, my question, considering that smartphone mobile NFC is just replacing something that has already existed, which is uh, acknowledged to be completely insecure, is the possibility of using the handset as a reader P2P device the main new threat, or will this card emulation with new players like Google, or maybe even the mobile phone companies, that are not used to operating within a secure environment posing a threat to the existing well-established ecosystem. I mean, it makes a good point. I mean, you're handing your credit card over to people. This is at least, you know, there's a PIN number and there's a little more security involved, right? Yeah, I, I think that, okay, so... So is the problem then, what he's saying is, is the problem the technology or the people who will be in charge of it? <laughs> um, I think he's also saying that he's sort of assuming that there's a way to... Put your existing contactless cards or replace your existing contactless cards with a phone-based NFC system. I think that's the intent. And, and, and so, the, you know, so yes, I think we do have a new threat because we, we are now, as we predicted we would be, we're talking about threats to smartphones. Right which are in the background in the same way that there are threats to regular PCs. So that, that has happened exactly as we knew it was going to. And so, for example, there's no way for malware to infect a, a contactless credit card. I mean, there's, there's, you know, it can't get in there. There's, there's, it's just, it's, it's not prone to attack. Yet, if you, if you, if you assume that responsibility with your NFC enabled smartphone so that it has your credentials, then we need to be really, I mean, really careful yeah. with, with the way this gets implemented. So my concern is I don't have any problem with the technology, but then, you know, we almost never do. Mo all, you know, we look around in the history of security problems is, you know, the technology being just what it is, technology. And it's always the implementation. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are protocol errors. Most of the time, it's, it's they, you know, errors. The, it's the designers forgot yeah. something yeah. or missed something or didn't see a back door. So 
I, you know, yeah. maybe I'm foolish, but I think I like Google. I think that the Google is is really engineering focused. These are smart yep. people. So far, they have not made any as correct me if I'm wrong, uh, security blunders, a la WEP or you you yep. peck. But um, so uh, you know, in some ways, I would trust them to do an implementation of NFC. Now, and, I did look at Philips's chips. Uh, Philips has a line of chips. It was a Philips chip that called the NTAG203 was the little itty bitty chip that was in the the, the paper um, NFC labels that I that I had that I showed um, last week. And this and so that sort of got me into the Philips zone and they actually have crypto available in this form factor. So although this NTAG203 didn't have active cryptography, you know, it had the ability to lock regions of the EEPROM so that they were after once written, they could no longer they could not be rewritten, they could not be changed, they could only be read. But and, and so this particular NTAG203 chip did not have this higher level. The, what I think he's talking about is this so called the so-called secure element. Um, it does look like we will be seeing NFC devices in the future that may actually be performing more crypto. And I think that's all good. It so, that doesn't solve the problem of, you know, smartphones still needing to be implemented correctly. Uh, but And I agree with you. I think Google, so far, they're doing a great job. Yeah. I, I look forward to it. I mean, I think just the idea of replacing uh, pieces of paper and plastic yep. in my wallet... Yep. With something a little more digital on my phone, I just like the idea. And I think we're going to go through a rough, a yeah. rough patch yeah. as we always do. But yeah, being able to wave your phone at the gas tank and have it say, "Oh, I I'm know ready. you," I'm go ready. Go ahead, fill up. You yeah, know, and the I'm way like Google Wallet works is it does ask for a PIN. So there, it's two factor. You have to have the phone and you have to have the PIN. Yep, that's more than my wallet. Um, you know, lose the phone, it's not like losing your wallet. Yep. Stephen in Glasgow, Scotland, shares his recent NFC experience. I think I knew of a problem with NFC. When I first got my Galaxy S3, it would quite often beep for no apparent reason. Every time I put it in my jacket, pocket, or on my table, it would beep. Then I noticed it was when I put it on my table resting on my wallet that it was beeping. I felt like an idiot for not figuring it out. Some of my newer credit cards have RFID chips inside for the new contactless payment systems. We don't have these in the U.S. yet. Or if we do, they're in very limited areas. Yes. It's one of the problems I have, you know, when you go to Europe, it's hard to buy gas because uh, our credit cards are dumb. <laughs> and you need a smart credit card to buy gas. And the Galaxy S3's reader was shouting out, hey, I found a tag. And sure enough, when I downloaded an NFC app from the Android store, the beep would then be accompanied by the card info displayed on the screen when I put my S3 near my wallet. If these phones are going to go crazy when we put them near a wallet with RFID cards, no wonder's Apple holding back. As far as I can see, there's no way to tell Android to ignore a tag. And even if you could, would that bat use battery as the RFID tag in your wallet was constantly shouting out, Hey, hey, I'm here. And your phone listened to the details before ignoring it again? Love the show. That's a great question. Yeah, and and again, I, I'm, I, I don't have a Galaxy S3, but I would be surprised if in the configuration... Let me look. ...you didn't have the ability to turn off NFC. Oh, yeah, you certainly do. And so, so what I would tell everybody... Turn it well, no matter what phone you have, if you are not actually using NFC... On a daily basis, absolutely turn it off. Just turn off the antenna. Turn off the receiver. Um, you'll save power, and you you will clearly be more secure. If you, I mean, if you do use it, then it's not going to be convenient to be flipping it off and on all the time um, until someone writes a little app that makes it easy to do that. And boy, I really hope that um, that we're going to see people implement a physical verification that you want a near field transaction before the phone just goes off and does it because you no know, we sure do need that there will definitely oh, be that kind of thing which actually leads us into our next question uh, which is Brian in Michigan he notes that NFC ta attacks are trivial with many current implementations i was 
a bit shocked at your benefit of the doubt about NFC. There is no doubt. Because I would think it would be almost trivial to attack. Here's my quick scenario. Several of the implementations will automatically go to a URL and an NFC tag without any user interaction. There will be browser vulnerabilities to browsers in the phone. The attacker places several NFC tags that have been crafted to send victims to their attack site. They head to the airport, subway, or any other crowded location at peak traffic time. They accidentally bump into people. Most phones are in pockets, so it's the target height of the tags for the attack. The victim's phone goes to the attack site while never even leaving their pocket. The site takes over the phone to copy contacts, send premium SMS messages, destroy data, or whatever else they feel like doing. I may be a bit overreacting, but I feel NFC has all the security problems with QR codes, which can do the same thing, but with the mm -hmm. added attack of not needing line of sight. Yep, and I think Brian's right. I mean, again... This is why there's there's so much temptation on the part of the gee whiz people. Oh, look at this. You know, just wave your phone past the poster and it automatically whoop, look automatically takes you to the website. It's like, oh, I know. But, <laughs> you know, Brian's scenario will come to pass if we let things be that easy. You know, do you have to back off and say, oh, my 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 NFC radio is off unless I'm using it or which is like, you know, first choice or yeah. it, you know, it prompts me for, do you want to go to this site and, and waits for permission before it does. So I just don't see a way around that. Well, that's, you know, that's an app specific implementation. I was trying to look at the Samsung tech tech tiles, but I haven't installed yet. I re redid my phone. Um, but I, you know, you, I'm sure that, I, for instance, Foursquare doesn't automatically check you in. It just takes you to that point. Um, I'm sure that what it could do is say, and should do, is say, here's a URL. You want to go to it. Yeah. Um, now, if the phone is locked, Tinfoil Hat says, as far as I know, Android <laughs> NFC does not take action if the phone is locked. That is correct, by the way. Good. You have to unlock the phone for NFC to work. I do know that for a fact. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very nice. That's sufficient. Yes. Just, I mean, I my phone is always locked when it's off. You know, I press the off button, it locks it. Yeah. Um, so don't worry about it. You have to. Well, you have to open do, the phone. Do, do, do worry do about worry it. Do worry about it. But, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's got it. It's got it implemented in a way that is not is is better than that than that scenario. Yep. Uh, Nathan Cooprider in Bedford reminds us that Rasinovich gives us answer to AV problem in episode 371. And listener feedback 151, our last listener feedback episode, Vern from the Bismarck Public Library, remember this, shared his continuing frustration with all traditional antivirus products. You and Leo expressed sympathy, proposed some incremental improvements, but it seems like you felt a complete solution did not exist. But actually, Mark Rusinovich actually mentioned and endorsed a solution when he was on the episode before. Uh, he calls it whitelisting, a default deny approach. I like whitelisting in general. A default deny approach, which only allows authorized apps, will complement AV and address the issues Vern raises. By the way, uh, this is what Apple's doing in OS X Mountain Lion. Whitelisting is the future of security as AV continues to falter. I confess I'm a little biased here since I work for Bit9. Our security product, Parity, provides the best whitelisting solution for endpoints and servers. But we aren't the only ones in this important space. He gives uh, the link to his uh, Bit9 version 7. I'd be happy to help you with any research into this area or set you up with people in our company who could answer questions as well. Whitelisting has arrived and works. Well, I, I saw Nathan's note and i thought that you know we really we sort of skipped over that and didn't really give much attention to it and it's not something we've ever talked about before while mark was on the show i related the the analogous situation which mark thought was actually a really good analogy which was to firewalls where in the beginning firewalls were would allow everything and deny specific protected ports. And we realized, oh, we're not good enough to do that. There, you know, stuff gets through. So the, now everybody is a deny everything and allow only those things through that we know we need to, which is 
the whitelisting approach as it applies to networking traffic. And 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 Leo, I agree with you. I, I mean, this is the this is the notion of the um, uh, whew, I've forgotten the word um, where you have someone tending a museum um, curation curation. Yes, the curated model where where you 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 have you know like corporate IT says these are the apps that we're going to allow you to run on your system and we're locking it down. So corporate you know, IT or Apple computer because it's exactly <laughs> what the App Store does. Well, and isn't Microsoft aiming in there too? I think so. We're seeing some some not rumbling. as not as dramatically. <laughs> Um, but uh, well, there is an app store. A completely wide open right. frontier. Right. So. There is an app store. But right now, if you if you upgrade to Mountain Lion uh, on your Macintosh, you have new security settings that give you. Now, the default is not the most draconian setting, but you but you have the option to uh, uh, so either. There's three options. You can say I will only down I will only allow applications downloaded from the Mac App Store. I will only allow applications downloaded. So that's fully curated, right? Apple Most curates. Safe. Yes. Of course, you know, you could uh, there's the argument does Apple, you know, can Apple fully curate, but right. that's the that's the presumption. Certainly it's better than just wide open. The second uh, choice, which is the one I've made and is actually very easy, is not onerous at all and is does add some security is Mac App Store and identified developers. Apple has a certificate uh. they give developers that they approve of and I think that is a great middle ground. Yep, and you do have the choice of it. Yeah, you download whatever you want anytime. But this is the same now. Apple is fully curated on the iPhone, and without jailbreaking, there's no way not to do that. Yep. Android is curated by default, but you can check a box that says allow third party sources. So this is nothing new. The the, the mobile platforms are already doing this, and as and is I Microsoft on Windows Phone. I do think that you know someday we'll look back and remember the days. When you just ran whatever software you wanted to <laughs> and, you know, held your breath. Yeah. Because uh, it's just, you know, as we become increasingly dependent upon our systems, as we wire this all more deeply into our, you know, the social fabric will become, you know, and, well, and as bad guys continue to be more and more aggressive about taking advantage of what used to be a free and open environment. Uh, we're probably going to have to be more conscious of of the threats that exist, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see whitelisting um, becoming more and more relevant. And I have to say, also, completely random, Bit Nine. When when I saw Bit Nine, I thought, you know, I think there was a Bit Nine graphics card. Oh, for the that Apple, sounds familiar. For the Apple II, I think you know it. I, I just like you know. Uh, I bet you huh. that <laughs> that's the same company because I think, think they were in Massachusetts. He said, "I I I I, I tried to to Google Bit Nine graphics because I was curious." But I mean, this was what thirty years ago. Yeah. So it's been a while, but I absolutely remember Bit Nine graphics. Um, and I I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same company. If uh, if Nathan is listening to this, maybe he can drop me a note and say, "Yes, that's us. We're What's still the, here." <laughs> What's the history of Bit Nine? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, they're now in security for sure. But uh, maybe maybe they were doing other stuff. That happens all the hey, time. Hey, I, I was doing light pens once, yeah. so you know that, that's right. Do evolve. That's why you know Bit Nine. They were in, they are in Walth, Waltham, Mass. So yeah, maybe it's the same. Steve, that's uh, we've come to the end of our uh, Q and A. Uh, thank you so much as always for making this uh, show possible. We couldn't do it without you, Steve. Not only spends a lot of time preparing the show and answering your questions, but he also uh, makes uh, on his own 16 kilobit versions available uh, audio for people who just want the smallest possible file size, and has a uh, pays to have it transcribed. And Lane does those great transcriptions. Those are both available on his site grc.com. And if you want to thank him, well, just buy a little spin right while you're there. That's where you'll find the world's finest hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. Now for SSDs too. Yay! Yay! It's also got lots of free stuff there. Lots of security programs, information, diet in information, the Sugar Hill. People have been asking, when are you going to do Sugar Hill, Sugar Hill Part 3? Leo, I get so much of that. I, I, we're going to have to do that. I've been continuously in ketosis now for six months, and it's 
the best thing I've ever stumbled into. So you're we, looking we really, so thin. We need to come. We need to come back and revisit that. Uh, and uh, Doctor Mom's now steaming once again. <laughs> Doesn't take long. <laughs> Sorry, Doctor Mom. Uh, what else? Um, Lots of just lots of great stuff. Visit GRC once in a while. That's also where you can ask questions at the feedback form there. GRC.com slash feedback. You should also uh, watch this show live because it's more fun that way. You can talk back. And as you can see, I refer to the chat room. I use information from the chat room. It's really great. The, by the way, the, the chat room saying that the graphics company was number nine, not bit nine. Oh, that's correct. Yes. Very good. Nine. See? See? Very good. That's why you got to watch live. We do it 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 uh, UTC, at least until uh, our summertime uh, goes away. Then we'll then we'll be at a different time. But for now, 1800 UTC uh, on uh, Wednesdays on Twitter. Are we TV. losing you soon? Um, for next week, I'm going to see Madonna, but I'll still be here on Wednesday. Oh, that's and- right. I, yeah, right. So yeah, Sarah was talking about you not doing uh, uh, iPad today. Uh, I miss. Right, right. Okay, good. No, and then I'm going away for a few weeks in November. I'll, but not I'll, till November. On that, but that's November. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and uh, so I'll be back next next Wednesday to do the show, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC. You can get it after the fact, though. On demand versions always available of all of our shows because really that's how we started. We flip flopped it. I mean, really, it was originally on demand, and you can watch us do it live. Now I want people to think, watch it live well, or get it on demand. And- Look at where our listeners are as evidenced by their locations that they talk about in the um, in, in the mailbag. The I mean, they're global. So many of them, Leo, I'm sorry to say, are asleep right now. No, I know. Yeah. Well, and one of the things we do is we try and we're trying, we're getting better and better at this, to do reruns. What we want to do is be 24-7, but, we, but we're live at some eight-hour juncture. But then while, repeat. While we're awake. While we're awake. And then we repeat and yeah. repeat. So that if you tune in at any time, we are not quite perfect at this yet, but the theory being you tune in whenever it's appropriate for you and just watch for eight hours, you'll get everything. And if you do that every day, you won't miss a thing. (laughs) You laugh, but there are people who do that. Dr. Mom. No work done either. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So we've decided to make this as convenient as possible because I know that if it's not convenient to watch or listen or participate, then you won't. So I hope you will. Uh, thank you, Steve. We appreciate it. You're the best. Seven years down, seven more to go. Absolutely. At least. You betcha. Well, it was so easy doing the first seven. I can easily see going uh, another seven. I mean, this first seven I went by like that. didn't even notice it passing. Yeah. You know? it's, like it's, all, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know if I'll do a third seven, though. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't re-upped for three terms. I'll let you know. Hey, we'll thank you, Steve. One, we'll, we'll take it one seven at a time. One seven at a time. That's good. I like it. Seven-year terms. There's something about seven that's good. Thank you, Steve. We'll see you next week on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Security Now.